then we meet again and no surprise with a, with a ghost book which is a great interest of mine the paranormal haunted houses 1907 cg harper i was just looking at this one a tale from norfolk mannington hall moated manor between the between the villages of Itteringham and Barningham and let's have a look Mannington Hall in discussing such subjects of this the supernatural it is always desirable to have the testimony of those whose good faith is not likely to be called in in question thus the ghost story told by the reverend dr jessop the well-known norfolk cleric is especially welcome it was originally uh, narrated by him in the athenum in the pages of that journal he told how on october the 10th 1879 going back a few years isn't it he visited Lord Orford at Mannington Hall for the purpose of consulting some out-of-the-way books in the library there. Arriving at four o'clock in the afternoon, he dined with his host and a company of four others. There, there was not, during the whole of the evening, any reference made to occult subjects and at half past ten the company separated by eleven o'clock the only person downstairs was dr jessop himself engaged in the library making literary references the family and the servants alike had retired to bed dr jessop was busily engaged and he soon accumulated a pile of volumes beside him let's have a little as per usual excuse me so there he is in the library with some accumulated volumes beside him he sat at a table near the fire and with occasional intervals for raking the fire together and warming his feet was thus engrossed in writing and reading by the light of four candles in silver candlesticks how delightful until uh, close upon one o'clock in the morning then thinking with some satisfaction that he would be able to conclude his labors in another hour or so he rested a while and winding his watch opened a bottle of seltzer water presently he resumed work again and, and came at last to the concluding volume I had been engaged upon it for about half an hour, says Dr. Jessop, and was just beginning to think that my work was drawing to a close when I, when as, uh, as I was actually writing, I, I saw a large white hand within a foot of my elbow. Turning my head, there sat a figure. Uh, of, of a somewhat large man with his back to the fire bending slightly over the table and apparently examining the pile of books that I had been at work upon. The man's face was turned away from me but I saw his closely cut reddish brown hair, his ear and shaved cheek, the eyebrow, the corner of the right eye, the side of the forehead and the uh, the large high cheekbone he was dressed in what i can only describe as a kind of ecclesiastical habit of thick corded silk or some such material close up to the throat and a narrow rim or edging of about an inch broad of satin or velvet serving serving as a stand-up collar and fitting close to the chin 
His right hand, which had first attracted my attention, was clasping without any great pressure the left hand. Both hands were in perfect repose, and the large blue veins of his left hand were conspicuous. I remember thinking that the hand was like the hand of Velasquez's magnificent dead knight in the National Gallery. I looked at my visitor for some seconds and was perfectly sure that he was not a reality. A thousand thoughts came crowding upon me, but not the least feeling of alarm or even uneasiness. Curiosity and a strong inter interest were uppermost. For an instant I felt eager to make a, a sketch of my friend, and I, I looked at a tray on my right for a pencil. Then I, then I thought, upstairs I have a sketchbook, shall I fetch it? There he sat, and I was fascinated, afraid not of his, of his staying, but lest he should go. Oh, well, what about that? Good heavens. Stopping in my writing, I lifted my left hand uh, from the paper, stretching it out to the pile of books and moved to the top one. I cannot explain why I did this. My arm passed in front of the figure and it vanished. I was simply disappointed and nothing more. I went on with my writing as if nothing had happened, perhaps for another five minutes and had actually got to the last few words of what I, I had determined to extract when the figure appeared again exactly in the same place and attitude as before I saw the hands close to my own I turned my head again to examine him more closely and I was framing a sentence to address him when I discovered that I, d I did not dare to speak. I was afraid of the sound of my own voice. There he sat, and there sat I. I turned my head again to the work and finished writing the two or three words I still had to write. The, the paper and my notes are at this moment before me and exhibit not the slightest tremor of nervousness. I could point out that the words I was writing when the phantom came and when he disappeared, having finished my work, I, I shut the book and threw it on the table. It made a slight noise as it fell. The figure vanished. Throwing myself back in the chair, I sat for some seconds looking at the fire with a curious mixture of feeling and I remembered wondering whether my friend would come again and if he did, whether, whether he would hide the fire from me. Then first there stole upon me a dread and a suspicion that I was beginning to lose my nerve. I remember yawning when, uh, when I rose, lit my bedroom candle, took my books in, into the inner library, mounted the chairs before and replaced five of the volumes, the six, I brought back and laid upon the table where I had been writing when the phantom did me the honour to appear to me. By this time I had lost all sense of uneasiness. I blew out the four candles and marched off to bed where I slept the sleep of the just or the guilty. I, I know not which, but I slept very soundly. Well, there you go. He wasn't afraid by seeing the apparition at all. Hmm. And there we are, Mannington Hall. Oh, the fuck. Nice to see you again. 
Hope you come back and we'll have another look in this book. Haunted Houses by Harper 1907. Until then, I wish you well and may your God go with you.